I am the vine, you the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him. The same beareth much fruit, for with what without me you can do nothing. This is from St. John's Gospel, chapter 15. My dear faithful, this past Friday was the feast day of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. His sacred heart is a symbol of his love for us, as well as being the heart of a God worthy of our adoration and the object of our love and devotion. Now, as St. John recorded for us, we must accept the invitation of our Lord to abide in him, or else we will be lost eternally. Now, I will now just take a little time to show the basis the very foundation on which we owe this magnificent devotion to the Sacred Heart. Let us now go, now go back to Calvary, where after the three-hour agony, our Lord died and gave up the ghost on, on the, while there on the cross after his crucifixion. Now afterwards, to confirm or assure that our Lord was dead, the Roman soldier Longius, Longinus, thrust his long lance into the side of our divine Savior. Now, as prophesied in sacred scripture, none of his bones had been broken by this crucifixion, but his side was opened, and the sacred heart was pierced. Now, the sacred heart of Jesus is then finally opened, and from the wound in the side flows blood and water. What are the special reasons for which the Savior permitted this last abuse of his sacred body? First, through this maltreatment, the reality of his death and consequently the reality of his resurrection were to be placed in the most, um, most obvious light. It would be a refutation in advance of all the assertions of unbelievers that Christ's death was only faked and that his resurrection was a sham. For understand, a man whose heart is pierced cannot possibly live. That is clearly understood. Then the opening of the heart of Jesus was the opening of his will in testament. Christ, it is true, had at the Last Supper spoken to his apostles about his testament. But this communication was made in a circle of his friends and was more of a private nature in, in a certain sense. Besides, a testament is legal and valid only after the death of the testator, the one who made it, the one it evolves. As before his death, it can at any time be annulled. It can be changed beforehand. But of course, our Lord wouldn't do that. Now the pagan world for which Christ had especially died should also be informed what the deceased had left to it. So our Lord was wanted this, for, obviously, for the Gentiles as well. And his last will and testament could be found nowhere but in his heart. His heart then must be opened, and this was done by a soldier of the Roman emperor, by an official person, as it were, and that in the presence of all interested parties. Now what a splendid discovery, what a precious inheritance we have. St. Ambrose says, water flowed out to cleanse us in blood to redeem us. Water flowed out of the open side to prefigure the first sacrament, which is baptism, in blood to prefigure the greatest and most excellent sacrament, that of the Eucharist. Now water, clear water, flowed out of the open side of the Redeemer to form the body of his bride, the Holy Church, in blood to nourish it and to give it perfection and completion. Now we understand with what, what, what right and in what sense the Holy Fathers speak of the seven sacraments, which, like the seven streams of grace, have flowed from the side of Christ. We understand in what sense they can say that Holy Church, the second Eve and the true mother of the living, proceeded from the side of the Redeemer, the second Adam, while he slay in the sleep of death. 
going on, the divine heart, the seat and fountain of all love and grace, must be opened to enable us to enter therein. The evangelist Saint Augustine tells us, used a well-considered word, for he did not say that the soldier wounded the side of our Lord, but that he opened it, indicating thereby that the wound of the side should be the entrance to the sacred heart. Now such great sim symbolism it, within God's grand plan, this is, we can say. And that should also remind us of uh, what we read about in the epistle in the gospel today, that we need to stay close to God for we know the devil comes out like a lion seeking to devour us. So we have great solace when we're in a state of grace and we're close to our Lord's sacred heart. And also, it, it is something uh, our Lord, think of uh, in the gospel passage we read today, he, went out, he told the parable of the shepherd who went out and found that lost sheep of, uh, uh, of the hundred, the one of the hundred that left. And he brought him back through that portal there. So those that fall away by God's grace, you know, if they repent, can come back and re-enter and be close to our Lord again. Something always to recall, no matter how far we may have strayed, like that sheep, you know, much rejoicing came about when he returned. So keep that in mind, dear faithful. Now indeed, the wound on the side is the portal of the true ark of Noah. For only what enters through this portal shall be saved from the universal destruction. Remember Noah's ark. You had to be in that ark and what have you, uh, and you lost your life there. And the fathers of the church, they, they can get, read into them of certain souls that... Uh, if, if they saved their souls outside the ark, they did not save their earthly life, and, and God only knows the few that may have been saved uh, by his mercy outside there. So we know by, our, by the sacraments of today, though, the church's truth, we know we have to stay in the church and be faithful to our Lord's commandments and live, die in a state of sanctifying grace. Now, the wound of the side is the golden gate, it can be said, of the true temple of the Lord, wherein all the sick... All the beggars and all the needy obtain health and grace and mercy. It is the entrance to the true paradise in which alone delight and peace are to be found. The world can't offer what our Lord does. Then it talks about uh, beggars on a street or those not doing too well to the world. They might not have much going on or be of much value to them in the world. But if they, those people, if, they are, if they're in a state of grace, if they're a friend of Christ and they're practicing the faith as best they can, they're, in God's eyes, they're more satisfactory than those living for the worldly pleasures and not living with God. You know, that is something to always recall. Now, Thomas had no sooner, St. Thomas the Apostle, had no sooner put his hand into this portal than he believed and loved and said, My Lord and my God. And think of that. For him to put his hand, it had to be a sizable wound, by the way. Uh, with that Roman lance going through, as you know, it, the point is it, very small, but it, it, it gets larger as the, as the lance is thrown up and it thrusts up all that way. Some say it may, even, may have gone out to the left side. Some say we don't know. But regardless, that made a giant gash opening in our Lord's side. And so, you know, but our Lord, he, he has that open wide for us because he is so generous. Now, the heart of Jesus is indeed the strength of the just, the consolation of the afflicted, the refuge of sinners. For the tempted soul it is the cavern in the rock in which the timid dove hides itself from the hawk. To the soul which feels itself to be a paracle, to, to be parched soil, to be very dried up soil, it is the fountain of living waters. It, re it, re it uh, restores, it gives it a potential to be alive again, so to speak, or fertile again. Now to the sad and depressed soul, it is the spiritual wine cellar in which the divine bridegroom gladdens his promised bride with heavenly delights. To the soul which is amazed at its coldness and dearth of love, meaning of the, the person, it is the inexhaustible furnace of that fire which the Son of God brought from heaven to earth. And it can, it can melt that soul. Now the Catholic Church, therefore, 
is wise in recommending very earnestly to her children the devotion to the sacred heart and in being ingenious in devising means for spreading and increasing it all over the world. But we know our Lord to, to many a soul, but uh, in a particular way, St. Gertrude the Great and later on, uh, St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, that, that sister who, were, by her being used, them being used as instruments, the devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus has uh, grown greatly into our day. We have, um, uh, what do you call it, that devotion uh, readily available to us. Now, with confidence then, we should enter into the Sacred Heart of Jesus in all of our needs. In it there is room for all sorts of men. Even Longinus, the soldier who had so cruelly wounded the heart, the heart of Christ, he received from it health and blessing. According to tradition, one of his eyes was bereft of sight. He could not see out of one eye. When he thrust a lance, a drop of the precious blood struck his eye, and he received his bodily, but more import importantly, spiritual sight at the same time. Now he was baptized and hid himself in a fearful desert to do penance for his sins. Now, as we call, he said, surely it is attributed to him that he said, surely this man was the son of God. And with that conversion on the spot, and as I'll go on, uh, he, uh, even though baptism, and he was baptized, washed away his sins, that strictly, you know, and strictly speaking, he did not have to do penance uh, of you know, reparation for his past sins because baptized wipes them out and so he'd have in a sense a, a clear slate. He wholeheartedly did much penance you know, going on to that desert for that, all that time. Now that is something to, for us to think about who may have been Christians all this, for a long time and uh, we, we've sinned and we, we do our sacramental penance but uh, are we doing other things uh, to, to atone for what we've done? to lessen that purgatory time, to, to make reparation. Something to think about there, faithful. Now, Longinus, he became a bishop and a martyr, a saint of the Catholic Church, a saint of heaven. What may we then not expect if we not only avoid wounding the sacred heart by sin, but strive to honor it, to spread its devotion, and to imitate its virtues? Let us then build our dwelling in the sacred heart of Jesus, petitioning the immaculate heart of Mary to help us live and die in this heart and be united with it forever. We pray, O adorable heart of Jesus, the most sweet and lovely of all hearts, receive the homage and adoration of thy children prostrate before thy altar, where thou remainest as on a throne of peace, of mercy, of grace. We consecrate to thee, O divine Savior, our hearts with all their weaknesses in, misery, in miseries. Do thou deign to receive them favorably, and out of the compassion and love of thy sacred heart, have mercy on us and save us. May the Lord always bless you through his Immaculate Mother. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.